Well, the Karen will come down today. You know, that's the little pile of rocks there in case you have forgotten. Uh, but I hope that you'll continue to use scripture uh, to help you uh, pray, to motivate your prayer, to direct your prayer, you know, to, to um, sometimes it will be praying just by inserting somebody's name into the scripture passage. Uh, we did that earlier at one of the passages, I think the second or third week. Well, it was another, it was uh, from Ephesians, and the one we looked at even last week was one that you could do that with. Uh, the one this week also, I think, is is a, a, a place where you can insert somebody's name uh, right in that scripture passage as you're praying. Um, now, I'm not saying rewrite the Bible. What I'm saying is use that as a guide for prayer. Use that as something to help you as you, as you pray for others. Um, but maybe sometimes the uh, passage will just highlight some specific areas for you uh, that you might want to pray about. Uh, you can certainly pray these, what we've been looking at, you can pray these as guidance for your own life. Uh, all of the things we've been looking at these last number of weeks, um, but I've tried to encourage you to pray them for others, uh, that you would pray these prayers, you know, pray this scripture for others. Um, and whether you, whether you use the, the scripture passages or not, let me encourage you to pray for others. You know, you should be praying for others. God tells us that in many places, many ways. We're to pray for our leaders, we're to pray for all those. Uh, and, and pray that God will, one of the things you can pray is that God will open up their hearts to know him, uh, you know, to make them receptive, responsive uh, to his word, to his truth. Um, you know, let's, uh, let's pray, and then we're going to look at our final passage in this series. Father, thank you for your word and truth. Thank you for the things that it continues to teach us. Thank you that it's not uh, simply uh, there but it is indeed powerful and effective as you tell us. And we ask, well, we know the, transformation, the transforming power it has had in our lives and needs to continue to have and help us to see and know and rely on your word. It tells us of you so that we can know and rely on you even more so that we can not be caught up in foolishness. Your word gives so many, uh, has so many uh, good directions, benefits, bring your word into our life today, this morning, that the passage we look at would just remind us again of you, our relationship with you, and all that you have done and all you have, all you still desire for us, uh, Father. So use your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to be in Hebrews 13, if you want to turn there. Hebrews chapter 13, just a couple of verses, page 1109 in the Pew Bible. And I'm going to try to remember, I have to stand still because this is the mic we're using today and I'm not used to standing still. But anyway, uh, just a couple of verses there. They're uh, sort of a benediction as the author of Hebrews is writing and he's kind of pulling this to, uh, to an end and to some conclusions. It's a sort of a benediction. Now, a benediction is simply, a re, it's, it's, re, it's requesting a blessing, and you see that happen here. Uh, requesting a blessing, really, that, that's prayer. Uh, it's usually, we, we, we talk about it at the end of a church service, you know, and that, that we have the benediction there. It's just, it's simply requesting something only God can give, and that is what we see here. So this is the benediction. Of, uh, on our series on uh, Karen's of prayer. So drop down to verse 20, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with all that is good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Glory belongs to him forever and ever. Amen. Now, some people, when they read this, and they would say, you know, as it starts out there, and it says, now may the God of peace, and some, some people claim God is not a God of peace. What we see over and over again is that repetition of violence in the Old Testament. How could we ever claim that God is a God of peace? I have heard people um, objecting, objecting to that, and and talking uh, really in, in some regards what a horribly uh, vindictive and, and mean God is laid out in, in the Old Testament and some 
uh, use that as an excuse to um, ignore or to denigrate uh, the Old Testament. One pastor of a very large church uh, in the Atlanta area, um, whose initials are Andy Stanley, um, even said that we uh, need to get unhitched from the Old Testament. Um, that, that is just uh, extremely wrong. Um, you know, it, it, that Old Testament is there for us. Now, we, we don't sit in judgment on the Word of God. God's Word sits in judgment on us. Uh, we come before Him. Uh, his Word is not dependent upon what we think is right or what we think is good. We should find what is right and what is good as we look at His Word. Now, some even go so far as to say the God of the Old Testament is a different God than what we see in the New Testament. And that's heresy, teaching which is against the Bible. Uh, you know, that, that is not accurate. It is, it is one God from beginning to end. And God is a God of peace. But he also battles on righteousness. You know, those, are not, those aren't in conflict at all. He battles those uh, who, who uh, act contrary to his purpose. Now, God is, by nature, uh, peaceful. And, but he's willing to battle when times call for it. In Isaiah chapter 57, he says, There is no peace for the wicked, says my God. You know, and the fact that God takes action against wickedness does not negate the fact that he is a God of peace. We might know someone who is a very peaceful person by nature, uh, but, you know, they stand up against unrighteousness, you know, and, and that, that gets them going. Um, you know, you know me, I'm calm as could be, but the, um, you, you know, you, you do something against my wife or my kids and, and uh, there's going to be a problem. Now, one of the things, uh, the difference there is um, I don't always act properly and righteously. God always does. But God, you know, he, he is a, a God of peace. Uh, but he is also one who stands against wickedness. Jesus said, uh, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do, I do not give as the world gives. Your heart must not be troubled or fearful. My peace I give you, he says. One of the names for Christ is Prince of Peace. You know, that, and, uh, describing who he is. And he came to bring peace. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith. Isn't that a great statement? If you think you're waiting until you step into eternity to have that righteousness of God, what he says is we have been declared righteous by faith. Because of that faith in what Christ has done, we are declared righteous right now even though you may not feel like it. You know, but he goes on, he says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not something that, we're, that we have to look, have to wait for at a certain time. That is something we have when we come to faith in him, and that is something we have. We have uh, been declared righteous, and we have that peace of God with us. So when you pray for others, pray that they have the peace of God. Pray they have the peace of God. Now that starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Without that relationship with Jesus Christ, they, they don't have peace with God. You know, they, they might feel all, 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 all hunky-dory. There's that word again. Uh, you know, they might, they might feel all wonderful and all that stuff, but if they don't have a relationship, if they, if they don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, they don't have that peace that they think they have. They don't have that, you know, everything is not okay. Everything is not just humming along fine. They have to have that relationship with Christ. That's where it starts. But even Christians, even those who have a relationship with Christ, sometimes have a lack of peace. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is, in many ways, overrun by sin. And there are many things that can knock us for a loop. And peace becomes absent. Peace just seems so far from us. I was with Barb this uh, last week as we, we met with the uh, cancer team over at Parkview Cancer Center. And um, going through you know, some of those, those discussions and um, they, you know, they asked her on, uh, you know, how she was doing and stuff. She said, well, I'm a little anxious. And they said, that's understandable. You know, we live in a world, now let me tell you too, 
you want to see the peace of God reign, sit down and talk to her. You know, sit down and talk to her. You know, and she, in, in the midst of facing this, you know, what is still really an uncertain cancer battle, um, the peace of God reigns in that woman. You know, and, but to, to see that, we can get knocked for a loop in this world. We have an enemy who would love to see us, who would love to see us, I was going to say off balance, even worse than that, you know, who would love to see us down and discouraged. You know, in Isaiah, he says, you will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace, for it is trusting in you. You know, we lack peace when our mind wanders off of God. When our mind wanders off of God, you know, we, we lack that peace. When our mind falls onto our problems or even our desires or even the uncertainty, when that happens, you see, that then we are not in that, in that perfect peace here that we want. Now, when you find yourself in that place and realize everybody gets in that place once in a while, Everybody gets in that place once in a while. And realize, you know, when you find yourself in that place, get your mind back on what it says here, that dependency on God. Now, it is not always easy. It isn't always easy. There's sometimes there's a monumental mountain, it seems, that we have to, that we have to climb to, you know, to get to that place. You know, and it's not always easy. It's not always immediately effective. You know, it's not always immediately effective. It, sometimes, it, you know, we, we think and we think, well, you know, I got my mind on you, Lord. How come I'm still all wound up? How come I'm still all anxious? How come, you know, and, and we think that, you know, it, it's, it's not always easy. It's not always instantaneous, but it is always important. Because if you don't, if you don't work and getting your mind stayed on him, your mind gets stayed on the struggle. Instead of living in God, you are living in the midst of that battle. Let me rephrase that. You are living in the midst of that trouble. You see. You are giving your mind to that trouble or you are giving your mind to God. And it is a battle. And it is a struggle. And that's where you keep getting back into what God has to say. He says there, our God of peace, notice what it says, brought up from the dead, our Lord Jesus. As I mentioned, you know, when we were doing communion, his crucifixion was probably the worst time for his followers. You know, it was a, a, a catastrophe. It was, you, it, in their minds at that point, life couldn't have gotten any worse. You know, it couldn't have gotten any worse, you know, as they were in the midst of that. But remember, from the midst of that tragedy, from the depths of that tragedy, the torture and death of Christ on the cross. He died on the cross when it says his body was broken, his blood was shed. It's talking of that physical, that physical, real physical pain that he went through as he was scourged, as he was whipped, as he was beaten, as he was abused. And, and you know, it, there was not only a physical, there was also that emotional thing because these people are rejecting him. His disciples fled. The, the, the populace is now rejecting him. You know, the, the soldiers were physically abusing him and he hung on that cross. And what did he say? My God. God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? He was going through hell for us, an innocent man. But remember, from the depths of that tragedy, from the depths of that tragedy, God brought life, new life, eternal life. He, he, he is bringing back that peace that we lack. He, is, he went through all of that. He, 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 said, he goes on and says that he, that he brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. A shepherd is a picture of caring, of providing. Um, it, it's, it, there's some great, some great beautiful pictures of God that are that are unfolded in the Old Testament of him as a shepherd. Now, I'm not going to get into that too much because, well, for a couple of reasons. One is, it's getting later, but mainly, I've been, I've been studying Psalm 23, and I think we're going to get into that in, uh, in probably in November. Um, 
but what a great, what a great picture, what a great picture um, of God, the great shepherd of the sheep. And he says, with the blood of the everlasting covenant. That highlights, that really highlights a huge distinction, an important distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is replete with covenants, you know, covenant and covenant and covenant. And you see that there's five main covenants in there. Um, I, I believe I put, yeah, I put the script, some scripture passages in your outline. Well, it talks about the Noah covenant. Uh, that's uh, with, with, you know, when the flood came and God promised he made that covenant to never destroy the earth again by a flood. You can say, well, there's floods. He's never destroyed the whole earth again by a flood. And he said he wouldn't. And then they have the Abrahamic covenant that God would make them into a great nation. Uh, you have the Mosaic Covenant where he talks that Israel would be his people. You have the Davidic Covenant where he promises that uh, God would establish David's throne and would always have a descendant as king on that throne and that Jesus is in the line of David when you read through the uh, genealogies in the beginning of the Gospels and it, it traces it back one all the way back to Adam but one you know to, to, there's that line in the line of David and then there's the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31 it says look the days are coming this is the Lord's declaration when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah this one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke, even though I had married them, the Lord's declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. You see, he wants to get across, this is the word of God here. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration. For I will give, forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. You see, they were used to having to make sacrifices over and over again. Why? Because that sin, that sin needed to be cared for, that sin needed to be atoned for. At the Last Supper, Jesus brought, uh, he brought this change from the animal sacrifices under the, that were called for under the Old Covenant. He brought in a change. He said to his, to his followers, in the same way, he took the cup and after supper said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood which is shed for you. When you pray, you know, pray they will have the peace of God which comes through the blood of the everlasting covenant which was secured for us on the cross. Now in the Old Testament, they repeated that shedding of blood of the animals. The New Testament, Jesus has sacrificed his life once for all. The blood of the everlasting covenant. No need to repeat any of the sacrifices for our sins. That's why we can read earlier in Hebrews where it says, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as the high priests do, first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. He did this once for all when he offered himself. Hebrews chapter nine, it says, he entered the most holy place once for all, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Talked about that blood of the everlasting covenant. Hebrews chapter 9. He says, Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 10.10 10. By this will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That phrase, once for all, appears six times in chapters 7 through 10 in, in Hebrews there, emphasizing that what Christ has done is it's not something that needs to be repeated. It's not something we add to. It's not something that is, was insufficient in and of itself. It is what was needed for our forgiveness. It is what was needed for our salvation, and it is the way in which we come to God. Jesus fulfilled the sacrificial requirements of the Old Testament covenants. 
Why don't we sacrifice anymore? Because Jesus fulfilled those sacrificial requirements. The, cere the ceremonial aspects of the Old Testament are unnecessary because Jesus fulfilled them. However, the moral aspects of the Old Testament are very much pertinent for us today. You cannot walk away from those. You cannot walk away from the way in which God called his people to live. You cannot walk away from the Ten Commandments in which he very clearly laid out the, the guidance for his people. You follow the Ten Commandments and, you know, I think every sin is a violation of the first commandment. Every sin. Now you'll have no other gods because when we sin, what are we doing? We're saying, I know better. I'm choosing a different way, and I know better. The moral aspects of the Old Testament are very much a part of what life is today. And the unfolding of, of how God dealt with those people, very much we can learn from today. So now we have, as it says here in, in Hebrews, we uh, now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. His blood sealed and ratified that new covenant. As Passover was instituted in in, uh, in Exodus, as God was leading, was rescuing, leading His people, getting His people out of out of Egypt, and and the plagues unfolded, plague after plague after plague, and then they get to this final plague, and, and God says, "This this is it," you know. This is it. Pharaoh is, you know, that dude is just going to, he's going to, he's going to be toast. He's going to let you guys go. And you have the plague of, of the death of the firstborn. And it says all the firstborn in Egypt, all the firstborn in the land were killed. All of, them were, all of them were killed, except for the ones marked with the blood on the doorframe. In Exodus 12, it says, the blood on the houses where you are staying uh, will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. When God moved through, he didn't look to see who was in the house. He didn't look to see how they lived. He looked for the blood on the door. And those houses, those places that were under the blood were spared. When he looks at us, he doesn't look to see all the good things you did. He looks to see if you are under the blood of Christ. Now may the God of peace who brought you up from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant. We don't need to follow the ceremonial aspects of the law, the sacrifices, the feasts, the ritual washings, but that doesn't mean we do nothing. That doesn't mean that you know, we, we, we just coast. So part of this benediction prayer, he goes on, he says that God will equip you with all that is good to do his will. To do his will. Pray, pray that they will be equipped to do God's will. This prayer is about God's will, not our wants. It's not about what we want. It's about what God wills. The disciples, if you would have taken a poll, they would not have wanted Jesus to die on the cross. They never, that wouldn't even have been on their list of things they wanted to unfold. But it was that necessary thing. It's not about our wants, it's about God's will. And doing God's will for us, even now, it requires our effort along with his power and our yielding to his guidance in our lives. Galatians chapter 2, it says, For you were saved by grace through faith, 
And this is not from yourself, it is God's gift, not from work so that no one can boast. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Our efforts, his power. You see, we're not working for something. We are not working for forgiveness. We are working from forgiveness. We are not working to be forgiven. We are working because we are forgiven. We are not working to get on good side. We are working from God's good side. We are working because we're already there, because we're already his, because we already have this relationship. You know, our efforts, his power. Our thoughts and ideas surrendered to his will. Always surrendered to his will. The prayer is that they will be equipped with all that is good. All that God gives is good. All that God gives is in harmony with his word. Psalm 84. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God wants us to succeed in doing his will. You need to have that last part on there because it's not just that God wants us to succeed. It is not just that, you know, God wants us to succeed and man, your pockets are gonna be full of money as long as you give me the money. You know how it goes. It's not that prosperity stuff where God, God is, you know, that, that heavenly father who wants to spoil his kids. No, it is the reality, you know, that, that God will withhold no good thing from those who walk uprightly. He wants us to succeed in doing his will. He wants us to be his more and more. Notice it goes on, it says, working what is pleasing in his sight. Pray, pray that they will, that their life, they will live their life pleasing to God. Pray they'll live their life pleasing to God. We're used to pleasing ourselves or pleasing others. Everyone in here has that bent. Every single person in here has that bent. That, that your actions are very much influenced by your wanting to please yourself or wanting to please others. And again, sometimes it's both of them. And you know, sometimes it's both of them. Uh, and, we, and we battle that. You know, it's usually a combination of two. A good question, you know, an easy question to ask yourself is what I am doing pleasing to God? Is what I'm thinking about pleasing to God? Is what I'm pursuing pleasing to God? Is what I'm watching pleasing to God? Is what I'm saying pleasing to God? Ask yourself, is how I am living pleasing to God? Now, as you're thinking about that, um, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Notice what he says here. It says that it, he is working in us. Working. We are in process. We are all still in process. You know, we all, if you've arrived, you're not here. If you've, you know, we've checked out. We've had our ticket punched and we're gone. Uh, you know, it's working in us. Don't be discouraged. Be determined. Be determined. Be determined to live for him. Don't give up. You know, they, I've been watch. I've been enjoying watching uh, my grandchildren. Many of them are running cross country. Uh, you know, Caleb has been in it for years, uh, and Emery and Aniston and Ryan are all running cross country, and I have been enjoying watching them and watching them learn. Uh, and Caleb has been, you know, he's further along the road, and to see him learn from the, those experiences that went on one of the things you learn in cross country, at least if you're related to me, you can't run your absolute fastest for the whole course. It just doesn't work. 
You know, I mean, I, these guys who win marathons, they, they, they run really fast, the whole thing. I'm just not built to do that. I, 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 I you know, it doesn't work for me and my body. Uh, yeah, but, but, you know, I, I was watching Caleb this last week, and, uh, you know, he came in first. Which was a cool answer to prayer for his grandpa. <laughs> Not that he'd be in first, uh, but that he'd be encouraged. Because I don't want him to give up. Because I want him to know what success is every once in a while. We're in process. Every once in a while, you're going to get it right. Celebrate that. Remember that. Remember that for the times that you're not first. For the times in which it doesn't quite come together the way you wanted. We are in process. Is how I'm living pleasing God? We're not as good at pleasing God as we would like to be. But we're better than we used to be. We're better at it than we used to be. I get more things right in following God now than I did before. And there's what he's talking about, that whole, that whole thing. Simply work to be better today than you were yesterday. You know, that we, we, we have this, you know, that God is, that he is working with, working in us what is pleasing in his sight. And then he says, through Jesus Christ. He wants us to succeed in living for him. Philippians chapter 2, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but so much more in my absence, work out, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, I thought we weren't supposed to have to work. I keep reading. He says, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You continue to work it out. Why? Because if God is going to work with you, guess what that means? You have to work. Get it? It's not that he's going to sit back and, you know, pull you along like the, I was going to say donkey, but some of you wouldn't like to be compared to a donkey. So um, he's, he's, he's not just pulling us along and dragging us along. He is working together with us. You know, he is, you know, he's, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Pray they will live their lives pleasing to God, yielded to him, following God's lead, embracing God's will. And he ends it, he says, glory belongs to him forever and ever. This has come up several times in this series already, uh, but it's worth repeating. Pray they will bring glory to God. Pray that they will bring glory to God, not to make a name for themselves, not to simply to make life easier, not just so that they can have less problems and less struggles, but pray that they will bring glory to God. And as these prayers we've been looking at, you know, all the other weeks and even today, you know, as these prayers are answered in their lives, they will bring glory to God. Pray that they will have peace with God. Pray that they will be equipped to do his will. Pray that they will live all their life pleasing to God. Pray that they will bring glory to God. And it ends with amen. So be it. May it be so. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you have done and are doing in us. Yeah, we're, we're, we can, some of us have this tendency to be able to say all the things that are wrong. But what we need to remember is we are made right in Christ. And we want to live a life that reflects that. 
We want to live a life that does bring glory to you. We want to have your peace. We want to live in that peace, knowing that it's there. And I, I pray for those who struggle with that right now, that you would guide them back. Help us to keep our minds stayed on you. Equip us to do your will, Father. You want us to succeed in living for you. Help us to live our life pleasing to you. Help us to remember, even to ask ourselves this question, is what I am doing right now pleasing to you? Help us, Father, to bring glory. Glory to you. May it be so. May it be true. Amen. Would you stand together for the benediction? And if you need prayer for anything uh, today, John is one of our deacons. Jess is one of our deaconesses. Uh, they'll be up front to pray with you and to pray for you. So if you need prayer for anything, whether it's something we've gone over in a sermon or just some challenges uh, that you've had for the week, uh, we'll pray, you know, and you want someone to pray with you or for you, as we dismiss, you come on up, and they'll be here to pray with you and for you. Other elders, deacons, deaconesses, they'll keep an eye and come pray with you too. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to set us before his presence without fault and with great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and dominion, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said.